Hello and welcome to the Underhive. We are back with some more How to Command the Death Guard. In this series, we're going to take a look at every aspect of the Death Guard. So whether you're looking to get more out of your army or you're thinking of joining Nurgle's dirty protest, then there's something here for you. Today, we're going to take a look at the general relics available from the Codex. We will take a look at the company-specific ones in the next videos. So today, we're going to be taking a look at the general relics that can be applied to any character with the 1CP stratagem available in Nephilim as your replacement to free Warlord trait. You can also use these stratagems in the Codex to give additional relics out at the requisition stage. That's when you're building the list, you commit to points to include additional relics. But at this point, you're not getting any for free. They are all going to cost you at least 1CP. So let's jump in and take a look at the relics on offer. First thing to note is that relics cannot be given to the two named characters. Technically, Typhus's Mastercrafted Man Reaper is a relic, so he can't have one. And technically, uh, Silence and Lantern, belonging to Mortarion, are relics, but they're not Codex relics. So you don't pay for them to take them, but you can't give them a relic on top. So it's just something to be aware of. Other than that, you can give it to any of the characters where relevant. Certain things only swap for certain gear, so they have to have that gear. But not only that, uh, you can also give them to your unit champions. So they, they are the sergeant of a squad. So your Plague Marines, your Blight Lords, your Death Shroud, the leader of that unit can take a relic if you'd like. So first up, we've got the Reaper of Glorious Entropy. So this can be swapped out with a model with the Man Reaper or Plague Reaper only. So this could go onto a uh, Lord of Contagion or a Death Shroud Champion. That's pretty much it. Uh, so what it does, it replaces their Man Reaper or Plague Reaper with what is a Plague Reaper profile. So it's the heavy equivalent profile of a Man Reaper, but slightly more strength because it's the Plague Reaper profile. Uh, so what it does is it gives strength times 2, AP minus 3, damage 3, and each time an attack is made with this weapon, an unmodified wound roll of a 6 inflicts one mortal wound to the target in addition to any normal damage. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a great means to pump out some additional damage through those mortal wounds. You will already have the ability to reroll ones if you've got Arch Contaminator, you may have additional wound rerolls to hit more sixes, so it can be a means to chuck out a few more wounds. Granted, whichever character is going to be equipped with this or champion, they're only going to have a handful of attacks. It's hitting at strength A, AP minus 3, damage 3. It's going to push some good damage through on its own most of the time. Given that you're reducing toughness, even against the toughness 5 model, you're going to be wounded on 2s. Anything more than that, you're almost guaranteed to be wounded on threes. The new Land Raider going up to Toughness 9, you would be wounding that on fours. The standard uh, Lord of Contagion, his Plague Reaper would have minus one to hit and doesn't have the Mortal Wounds. The good thing about the Lord of Contagion is that he can take a Plague Reaper or he can swap that for a Man Reaper and an Orb of Desiccation. We will come back to him individually on his on his own um, data sheet. But the point is, you can have the Orb of Desiccation and then swap the Man Reaper for an upgraded Plague Reaper. So you can have the best of both worlds if you're willing to spend a, a Relic for it. As far as the Death Shroud Champion, the closest comparison is with his Heavy Attack, uh, which would be Strength 7, AP minus 3, Damage 2, and has the minus 1 to hit. So he's getting an extra damage, he's getting an extra strength, and he's not minus one to hit, and he gets the mortal wounds. It is only five attacks either way around, so you're not going to pump out loads of mortal wounds, but I can certainly see the reason to take it if you've got a spare CP to use. Next up, we've got the Plague Skull of Glothilla, which is my favourite relic. Once per battle, at the end of the movement phase, so it's not a shooting attack, at the end of the movement phase, the bearer can use this relic. If it does, select one enemy, roll seven d6s. For each four or five, they suffer one mortal wound. And on six, they suffer d3 mortal wounds. So on average, you're going to pump out three or four mortal wounds here. But you could get lucky and get more than that. Uh, so it can 
quite often put out a character. It's not likely to kill a, a you know a monstrous character, a big Tyranid monster or something, uh, but you know a typical on for infantry character might only have between four and eight wounds. You could quite consistently get through most of their health, if not all of it, particularly if they're on the lower end of that spectrum. Something like High Marshal Helbrecht is probably going to survive, but a typical Primaris Lieutenant or Apothecary isn't necessarily going to. Uh, again, that can go on a champion or it can go on your warlord. Personally, I like it on the Plague Marine champions, even more so since they've been buffed. But again, we'll come back to that. Uh, but it's just a great delivery system. Your opponent doesn't necessarily want to use shots on your uh, on your Plague Marines unless they're on an objective. But you do want to be moving them towards your opponent to get them into their melee range because of, of contagions being so effective. So uh, ultimately, having the play skull of Glothilla means you get close, you're ready to make that five or six inch charge, but before you do, you soften that unit up with a handful of mortal wounds, possibly even killing them. Fantastic stuff. Next up, we've got the Demon's Toll. So this is only available to the Noxious Blightbringer himself, the guy with the big bell above his head and the small bell in his hand. Uh, what it does, once per battle at the start of your opponent's movement phase, the bearer can use this uh, relic. If it does, select one enemy unit within six until the end of the phase. If that unit is selected to fall back, roll a d6 on a two-up. That unit cannot fall back and must remain stationary. There are many abilities out there where units can fall back and shoot, which is not something you'd want to happen. Uh, there are abilities out there where units can fall back, shoot and charge, or just fall back and charge. And many of those units get a benefit for having counted as charged. There are ways to mitigate that separately, but simply preventing them falling back also prevents them charging. The one downside is that it's only once per battle, but it is a pretty strong effect. Next up, Fulgaris's Helm. This is quite a straightforward one. Add three inches to the range of the bearer's aura abilities to a maximum of 12. Does not affect your contagions because they are not an aura, but it would affect things like a um, like a command rerolls, you know, from your from your demon prince. He give reroll ones to hit. That is an aura. Uh, you can then extend that aura by three inches to make it nine inch reroll ones. Uh, there are a variety of auras in the codex. Many of them are good. So extending them by three inches, just flat across the whole game, is nice. It's not necessarily really strong, but. It can be a nice force multiplier, and it's definitely one to consider. Next up, we got the Toll Keeper. So the Toll Keeper is available only to the Tallyman. So he already has some auras of his own, which we will come back to. But this relic gives him the Toll Keeper aura. While a play Company core unit is within six inch of the bearer, each time that model makes a ranged attack, unmodified sixes uh, to hit, score one additional hit. Now, this is one of the reasons I wanted to redo the series. It's not the only one, but this is far better now because you can run a squad of 10 Plague Marines and fully upgrade their weapons and have them as an actual range threat without them breaking the bank on points. A Tallyman is a far better pick now alongside Tollkeeper because if you've got two Melters, a few Plasmas, a couple of Blight Launchers in that squad, you can even have some other bits on top. But even just with that, an extra one of those is always lovely. So uh, again, I think the buff to Plague Marines is also a pseudo buff to the Tallyman in that it makes the abilities he has and on the Relic he can take that bit more viable in conjunction with Plague Marines specifically. Next up, Revolting Stench Vats. So this is one that was a, a good pick previous, but I think has got even better. Mainly because, again, Plague Marines, you can run them full melee at no additional cost, so you're going to do that now. You may even be running Plague Marines when you wouldn't have run them previous because of the free extra upgrades. Uh, the Foul Blight Spawn works very well, sat behind a squad of melee Plague Marines, because not only does he have his own auras that benefit that, but with Revolting Stench Fats, while an enemy unit is within six of the bearer, that unit cannot make any use of rules that allow it to fight first, and it never counts as having charge, regardless of any rules it may have. So there are certain armies that love counting as charging. White Scars are the obvious one there. They get additional damage. Um, and of course, if they're in Assault Doctrine, they'll get additional AP as well. Uh, but ultimately, there are a few armies out there that like to count as charging. Not necessarily to the extent White Scars do, but 
to some extent. And denying them that ability is always great because that's how they've probably built their army. So you're completely shutting down their game plan. But not only that, just denying units fighting first means you get to punch them first. And now that you could go full melee plague marines with some big damage weapons like the cleavers and the flails, your enemy's going to be less likely to want to take that trade. If they see the blight, uh, blight spawn there, they'll probably think twice now where previously they'd have gone, well, I'm going to take the hits on the plague knives, but I need to do this. If they're charging into axes and flails, it may just be that they're throwing that unit away by doing so. And you could probably deny areas of the board from opponents for at least a turn or two because they're just not in the numbers they'll need to overcome the fact that you're going to hit them first. So again, I think we'll see more Blight Spawns and I think we'll see them with the Revolting Stench Fats even more frequently than they were previous, which to be fair was most of the time they were taken. Uh, next up, Superating Plague. Superating Plague. Uh, when the bearer, uh, sorry, you quit this on somebody and the bearer has a, char a save characteristic of two uh, or two plus. So there are a few characters out there that are not in Terminator armor that have a three up save. So you can give them a two up save, which is nice. Of course, they've got armor of contempt, so they're getting the reduction to AP as well. You could put them in light cover. With all that combined, it puts them on a, a minus one up save. Obviously, you still always fail on a one, but that means even an AP2 weapon, you'd still have a two up save with Armor of Contempt and Light Cover. So, uh, yeah, it's a great way to, to buff the durability, though not guaranteed to, because it's based on whether you roll well or not. Uh, but also, each time an enemy unit fights, if the bearer lost wounds as a result of those attacks, roll a d6 on a two up, that unit suffers one mortal wound. Uh, I think the reason you take it is to have a two-up save, which isn't that strong all said and done, given your unit has got at least armor of contempt anyway, and you could probably hide them in some light cover, some of the game at least. So I don't think separating plate's going to see much pick now after armor of contempt, and I don't think Nephilim's helped it in any way. And then the last one there is Plaguebringer. So this can be equipped on a model in exchange for a Bale Sword, Demonic Plague Blade, Plague Knife, or Power Sword. So uh, again, this can go on Champions, could go on a Blight Lord Champion if they have the sword. It could go on a Plague Marine Champion, whether they have the Knife or the Plague Blade. And it can also go on the Plague Surgeon, who has a Bale Sword. Okay, the Terminator Lord can't, but the regular Lord can. Uh, the Sorcerer Lord cannot so you could chuck it on a chaos lord personally i don't see why you'd ever run a chaos lord other than points and if it's that you're running out of points you're probably not planning to buff him up he's probably just there to reroll ones for people so uh that said and done i don't think it's a bad pick on the um plague surgeon does make him a bit more dangerous don't think it's a bad pick on blight lords either on the champion but overall not a must pick it's I would say it's not as impactful as the Reaper of Glorious Entropy is on the respective models that can go on. What it does is it is strength plus two. So it would put the Blight Lords or the Surgeon to strength six, which is a nice break point. It's AP minus three. So it's the standard AP for a Power Sword. And it's damage two. So it is going to kill Space Marine models and more elite infantry from the squishier factions uh, in a single hit. But not only that, each time a model is destroyed as a result of an attack made by this weapon, it counts as two models destroyed for the purposes of morale tests this turn. So you're more likely to get enemies run away. That does fall in line with the new um, rendition of the Nephilim secondaries. I haven't received my Nephilim book yet, so I'm going to address that once I've got all of the, you know, the words in front of me. But I am familiar with the change, and I do think it's an improvement um, in terms of getting kills with plague weapons and making enemies run away rather than just making enemies run away. So I think that secondary is a reason to pick Playbringer, but I don't think it's a strong reason to pick it. I think that probably won't see much play, but it is a reasonable pick if you want it. That's everything for the general relics. I think the big winners there are the Tollkeeper and the Revolting Stench Vats because those support characters Firstly, the army has dropped points, so you're going to be able to fit one in when you couldn't previously. Uh, but secondly, if you were running Plague Marines anyway, they are now better in whichever direction you wanted to take them in. And as a result, the characters that can support them get more support done. So either way around, both of those looking very nice. 
and I always like the play skull of Glathilla, so you could certainly still end up spending three CP on those, even after the Nephilim changes. I still think that would be a worthwhile investment. Uh, but that's it for the relics. We will move on to the company-specific stuff next. Uh, I hope you're enjoying the series, and I will catch you next time in the Underhive.